The French Foreign Minister says France is immediately recalling its ambassadors to Australia and the United States in response to the new AUKUS submarine deal. Now, the pact means that Australia has scrapped a $90 billion contract to buy French conventional submarines in favour of nuclear-powered subs built with US technology. Let's now bring in our politician panel, and we're joined by Liberal MP Jason Falinski. We're also joined by Labour MP Andrew Giles. Welcome to you both. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Jason Falinski, if I could start with you. Now that we have the French uh, ambassador being recalled, it's pretty serious. This is a diplomatic stouch. Was this deal made without considering Australia's ties to France? Uh, Fazia, this deal was made with one consideration in mind, and that is the safety and security of Australia and its people. Um, the French are uh, about to go through an election season. There is no doubt that this is what the French government needed to do in terms of sending a signal to their people that they're standing up for the interests of French and French companies, of France, sorry, and French companies. And so that's important. But the Australian government is driven by other considerations primarily, and it is the first obligation of any government to ensure the safety and security of the people of Australia. Andrew Giles, Indonesia appears to have cancelled a visit by Scott Morrison on his return journey from Washington DC next week on account of this same deal. Has Australia botched its relations with its allies over this? Well, we need to hear a lot more from the Prime Minister and Prime Minister Payne about this. I mean, the, the reaction of France is something that we have to take very, very seriously. Um, France is not only a long-standing ally, but it's a very, very significant partner in the Pacific. Um, Indonesia, of course, is uh, uh, our nearest neighbour and an absolutely vital partner. So we do need to understand, while, of course, Labor welcomes the strategic opportunities of this uh, expanded partnership, this has got to be um, in addition to those existing partnerships, not at the cost of them. And it's really important that we get a clear message from the government as to what is going on here. Uh, Jason Feliski, you know, you said that this deal was made with Australia's security in mind. I want to take you back to a tweet that uh, you published in the last few days or so, and you say that in the next few decades, our region will become more uncertain and challenging. We cannot possibly hope to meet those challenges alone and need all the alliances we can be part of. Australia is not alone, though, in facing the challenge that uh, China uh, gives to this particular region. Uh, why not reach out? What, well, why the decision to reach out to a declining superpower? Power, like the United States, instead of reaching out to our regional neighbours to form a stronger alliance against China's rising power? Well, basically, there's, there's a lot in that statement um, which I think I'm going to have to take uh, exception to. Firstly, um, neither you nor I can um, accurately predict the future, and I think it's a bit... Um, well, how do I say this politely? I, I think it's a bit uh, premature to be predicting the decline of the United States as a significant economic, military and cultural power in the world. I'd also probably suggest to you that what you're saying is absolutely right, which um, is that Australia can be friends with both the United States and Indonesia and South Pacific and Singapore and most of Southeast Asia. And I'm not suggesting, by the way, in my tweets that the, that China is the driver of uncertainty and challenge in our um, region. But what we do have is a number of emerging powers in this region who are to um, ascertain and protect their national interests. All that Australia is doing in this deal is ensuring that we have the best military deterrence to ensure the safety and security of both this nation and the people who live in it. And that is the primary goal of any government, to ensure the safety and security of its nation and its people. And I believe this week that is what we did in a manner and form that hasn't been done, frankly, since the 1950s or 1960s. Jason Falinski, that's the headline. Why don't we know how much this new defence pact and the nuclear-powered submarine 
Green Deal will cost. How much will it cost to break the contract? How much for the submarines themselves? The PM says we are going to be spending a lot more on defence. How much will that come to? How much is it all going to cost and, in and add to the additional debt that there will be over decades to come? Kirsten, they are really excellent questions. And I have to say to you, I don't have the answers to, the, to all of those questions. Should what Australians I do know... have more of an idea right now? Should, there have Sorry, been, that, should Australians have been given more information this past week than just the headlines of this new defence pact? No, I don't think so, Kirsten. I think what Australians have been given is everything that we know at this point in time. So I can answer some of those questions if you're interested. But the fact of the matter is that we don't know what the future challenges present both to Australia and, those, and our allies in this region. And but indeed, we must have a war. budget. We and must we have a budget know. for this so, particular project. So, sorry, sorry, Kirsten, I just, if, if I might. Um, no, we don't. Uh, the, what we announced this week is that there will be an 18-month um, process where we, we where we'll, we'll be developing the technology and the development roadmap for that. We know that it will be somewhere in the vicinity of $90 billion, so it's a replacement of the current contract we have. What the exact figure will be will be determined by what that technology roadmap involves. What this will mean is that we will have either the most advanced submarines in the world or equivalent of um, the most advanced submarines in the world. Now, I am happy to stand anywhere and defend this decision in the interests of both Australia and its people and ensuring their safety and security. And I defy anyone, frankly, to come on this show or anywhere else and suggest that this agreement that we struck on behalf of the Australian people does not massively advance the safety and security both of our nation and of this region. But that is up for others to do. There's, there's a lot to unpack in this particular story. And no doubt it is a developing story and we will have lots more to talk about. Uh, and and Fancy, can I, can I say, and I'm sorry to, to interrupt, can I say it will be developing over decades, not over the next few months, but over decades. Right. We don't know what... Right. Uh, the new structure in this region will look like. Right, OK. We want to move on to another story, of course. Um, the Minister, Christian Porter, made the headlines once again uh, this week. Andrew Giles, I want to put this question to you because I found a tweet on, on, on your uh, handle. Uh, you tweeted, Imagine being Prime Minister and needing advice on whether it's appropriate for a Cabinet Minister to accept a million dollars from an unknown source. Why shouldn't the Prime Minister consult um, with his press secretary or with, with his secretary uh, and seek advice on the legality of his minister's actions? Well, I think that's a separate issue than, it is, than the minister's compliance with either the ministerial standards. That's a matter for the prime minister himself. And frankly, this is an issue that shouldn't require any special advice. I think every Australian understands that it is utterly inappropriate for any member of parliament to be accepting that sum of money from undisclosed donors. Indeed, the uh, Minister Porter, when he was the Attorney General, uh, made much of this in other circumstances. It is extraordinary, actually, and it comes down to the, the nature of the government that Mr Morrison leads, that a minister can feel that he could accept such a donation. It is utterly ridiculous that Griffin Porter is still a minister today. It speaks to Mr Porter's understanding of his obligations to the Australian community. But far more substantively, this is a question about the character of our Prime Minister. And if Christian Porter is still a minister at the end of today, that's an indictment on the standards that Mr Morrison believes are appropriate in public life in Australia. Jason Falinski, does the delay on this issue and a response from the Prime Minister's office arise from concern that Christian Porter might quit Parliament if dumped as a minister, costing the government its majority? Uh, Kirsten, I think that's an incredibly long bow and one that for which there is very little evidence. But what I would say is that the Prime Minister has sought legal advice on this through his departmental secretary. Um, I suspect but don't know that that advice will come from the Solicitor General. Mm. Uh, I think we should all wait to find out what that advice says and the Prime Minister will um, take what action he needs to on the basis of that advice.
Uh, we want to move on to another story, and, and that is um, Labor Senator Christina Keneally um, being pre-selected for the Safe Southwest Sydney uh, electorate of Fowler, um, putting her, of course, in the lower house. Uh, Andrew Giles, you are the shadow minister for multicultural affairs. No doubt you would be then in support of uh, diversity. What do you make of your party's decision uh, to sideline a Vietnamese candidate with West Sydney community re representative in favour of Christina Keneally, who is basically from the other side of Sydney. You know what, this is a really important debate, Bowsier, and, and I think two things can be true. Uh, I'm really privileged to get to work closely with Christina Keneally, and I don't think there's any doubt that the interests of the Labor Party and the millions of Australians who depend on us uh, are advanced by having Christina in the parliament. But it's also the case that we do need to do better in ensuring the diversity in the Australian community is reflected in the parliament. But the, this was reflected. an opportunity. This was an opportunity for Labor to do better and not to yeah. sideswipe a local Vietnamese candidate. Well, indeed, but I, I, I'm, not, I'm not desperately close to the pre-selection in Fowler, but I am concerned about the wider issue and making sure that we confront the structural issues that mean that our parliament and, indeed, most institutions of power and influence in Australia aren't as diverse as the Australian community. I think when I look at Labor, I think about the efforts that we have made to deal with similar structural issues when it comes to the representation of women and, indeed, more recently, of First Nations Australians. We have undertaken some significant steps, putting in place diversity fellowship, um, putting in place in our platform a commitment to measure and then work towards um, more diversity, putting in place in the Federal Labor Caucus a multicultural caucus committee to ensure that diverse perspectives are brought to bear on every decision we make. Now, that's not to say there's not a lot more to be done. Uh, and I, I certainly believe that there is more to be done. But I don't think having a reductive uh, argument between the merits of two fantastic candidates can resolve this more complicated question.